In a population of wild sweet pea plants, you assume are in hardy Weinberg equilibrium, you sample 1,000 plants. 160 plants have recessive red flower color, which is little p, little p, and 840 of the plants have a dominant purple flower color, big p, and the other allele doesn't matter because it's dominant. So any other allele will still result in the dominant color. What is the frequency of the recessive allele associated with the red flower? With regards to this problem, we are supposed to refer to two equations. And that is the Hardy-Weinberg genotype equi equilibrium equation as well as the Hardy-Weinberg allele equation. The Hardy-Weinberg genotype equi equilibrium equation is p squared plus 2pq plus q squared equals 1. And the allele equation is p plus q equals 1. Now that we have this, what we can do is we can look at all the information we have and we can determine what the genotype as well as the allele frequencies are. The way that we do this is we have to look at the homozygous recessive individuals. And we know that if they are recessive, then they're going to be homozygous regardless. We see that we have a total of 160 plants that have their recessive flower color, meaning that they have the genotype little p, little p. Now, q squared is the amount of individuals who are recessive in a population. So initially, what we, what we would assume it, q squared would equal, is 160. However, that's incorrect. This equation, if we look closely, it equals 1. Since it equals 1, that tells us that this is ultimately in a frequency. So q squared is not equal to the amount or the number of homozygous recessive individuals in the population. It's equal to the frequency of the homozygous recessive individuals in the population. What that is, it's ultimately the amount of homozygous recessive individuals inside the population divided by the total population. We know the total population is 1,000, so Q squared is equal to 160 recessive individuals divided by the total population of 1,000, which equals 0.16. So 0.16 is equal to Q squared, or the frequency of homozygous recessive individuals. The question is asking us to find the allele frequency of the recessive allele. The recessive allele is going to be equal to Q. In order to solve that, simply just square Q squared, or square root Q squared, as well as 0.16, and that will give us Q, which comes out to equal 0.4. So 0.4 is the correct answer on the <clears throat> recessive allele frequency. Now, from this information, if this was asking us what is, all, what is the dominant allele frequency, we would simply plug this into the equation for the alleles, and that would tell us that P, or the dominant allele frequency, is equal to 0.6. Then what we could do is we can add this information into the genotype equation, which would give us the frequency of individuals who are homozygous dominant or heterozygous in the population. On to population genetics. So which of the following inferences are consistent with the trajectory, trajectories of allele frequencies in the figure below? So here we have the frequency of the allele little a in the population. As we can see, all of these different lines or trajectories are just different populations. Now, before we even answer any questions, we can determine a few things from looking at this. We see that among all of these different populations, the frequency of the little a allele is decreasing. If the frequency of an allele is decreasing, that must mean it's not beneficial for the population because selection is going to favor alleles that increase the fitness individu of individuals in the population. So since they are all decreasing in the population, we know that this allele is not the most beneficial allele in the population. Granted, we can see that they're all decreasing at different rates. And since we can determine or we can see that they are decreasing at different rates, that tells us that this allele has greater effects on some populations as opposed to other populations. So for this, I don't know what color, I think that's kind of pinkish. For this population, <clears throat> they are being affected to a greater extent by this allele from the B population. We can see that they're decreasing at a far greater rate, which means that this allele has a greater effect or greater fitness effect on this population. And this is before even looking at any of the questions or what the question is even asking. So now this asks us to look at the following inferences and see if they are consistent with the trajectories that are present. So 
The yellow-orange trajectory is for an allele with larger fitness effects than that depicted by the purple line. So essentially, this trajectory of this line has greater fitness effects or is impacted more greatly by this allele as opposed to the purple line. The answer to that would be true because it's decreasing at a far greater rate. The slope is far greater. Since it's decreasing more steeply, that tells us that this allele affected this population to a greater extent since it's decreasing a lot more rapidly. Therefore, that is true. So the little a allele has a positive effect on fitness. As we can see in every single one of these populations, this allele frequency is decreasing. That tells us that ultimately, this is not beneficial for the population. So it's false because the little a allele has a negative effect on fitness. The green trajectory is for an allele with larger effects than depicted by the yellow orange line. So this trajectory right here has greater fitness effects as opposed to this trajectory. That is also false. It's decreasing at a far lesser rate than the yellow orange line, which means that this allele is not affecting it as much so it can stay in the population for longer. Therefore, it doesn't have, it does not have more of a fitness effect on the green population. So this, is, this one is also false. The little a allele has a negative effect on fitness. That is true since it's decreasing in, in the populations. The alternate allele will decrease in frequency in the population. So, with regards to little a allele, we all know that we know that it's decreasing. However, if one allele is decreasing, that must mean that there is another allele that must be increasing. You can't have two alleles, such as big A and little a, both decreasing. That would mean that the amount of alleles in the population overall is decreasing. And I don't, I, I yes. Well, yeah, that could be the case. If you were to have, like, if you were to have multiple blood types, such as uh, with regards to blood type, we have blood type A, blood type B, and blood type just O. You could have one of those alleles that are competing all the other alleles, and all those other alleles are decreasing. However, in this case, we're just going to assume that we have two alleles, unless specifically stated there are three alleles, and then they give us all the different trajectories. We can't confirm that, but what we, what we do know is that we have an allele and we can assume that there is another allele. And so since there are two alleles, one allele that, if one allele decreases, the other allele must make up for it by increasing. They are both inversely related. If one decreases, the other increases. If one increases, the other decreases. Likewise, in this case, if the little a allele is decreasing, then the big A allele must increase. There always must be a balance between these different alleles. So the alternate allele will not decrease in the population, rather it will increase. Sorry, what? It's the dominant one anyway. Well, that's just the one that we've, the example that I've given. It could be little a squared. I don't know. Just any other allele. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter. <clears throat> on to the next problem. You work on another species of plant where you have sampled natural populations that have red, pink, and white flower color, which is associated with additive or codominant effects of the R1 and R2 alleles. R1, R1 plants make red flowers, R1, R2 plants make pink flowers, and R2, R2 plants make white flowers. You sample from a natural population the following plants, and we have all of these different uh, amounts of individuals with these different genotypes. What is the allele frequency of R1? Uh, before I answer this, I just, I'm a bit bothered by this question, simply because it's not truly co-dominant, because they're mixing together, and that's incomplete dominance. I just thought I'd mention that. Yeah, it just bothers me a little bit, slightly, you know? Gotcha. Mad rat, I swear. All right. Sorry, I'm just... It's a great day, you know? This one? Exactly. So if we look at this population, we're given the total amount of individuals in the population, and we're given also their genotypes which typically doesn't happen with these hardy weimar equilibrium equation problems. So we are trying to find the frequency of the R1 allele. We have a total of 10 individuals who are homozygous recessive, meaning that they carry two R1 alleles. And by the way, for solving this problem, we have to use the hardy weimar equilibrium equation 
Oh, there are no recessive or dominant alleles. You can just label either one of them, P or Q. For solving these problems, I prefer to choose the smaller number to be Q. So in this case, Q is going to be equal to the allele R1, and P is going to be equal to the allele R2. You could easily do the exact opposite. It doesn't really matter. But we know that we have 10 individuals who are homozygous recessive in the population, meaning that they have two R1s. So the amount of R1 alleles present in the recessive individuals is going to be 10 times 2 for the two alleles that they do have, and there's 10 total individuals. So 10 times 2, which is a total of 20 R1 alleles in the homozygous recessive individuals. Looking at the heterozygous individuals, we have 225 of them present in the population. And out of that 225, each of them have at least one R1 allele, or they have one R1 allele, which means that the R1 allele frequency and the heterozygous individuals is 225 because they have 225 total individuals, each of them having two alleles, one of those alleles being R1. For the, homo for the homozygous dominant for the white individuals, 765 of them are present and none of them have the R1 allele, so that is going to be equal to zero. Now we can add these R1 alleles together to give us a total of 245 R1 alleles present in this population. Now that we have the total number of R1 alleles present in this population, recall that for the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium equation, they are all in frequencies. So ultimately we have Q, but we just need to convert that into a frequency. So 225 R1 alleles divided by the total amount of alleles in the population. Now we have a total of 1,000 individuals in the population. 1,000 individuals, each of them have two alleles because they're diploid. So 1,000 times 2 equals 2,000. So there's a total of 2,000 alleles in the population. 225 divided by 2,000 equals... Hmm? 245. Equals 200.245? No, no, no. It should be 245 oh, sorry. divided by 2,000. I'm just making sure. Yeah. Oopsie. This is 245. Yeah. 245 divided by 2,000... That equals 0.1 or 0.1225. And that gives us <clears throat> the allele frequency for R1 in this population. Likewise, from this information, we are able to find out the frequency for P or R2. And we're also able to just utilize that for our benefit. And if we wanted, what we could do is we can plug that information into the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium equation for the genotypes. And we can determine what we would have expected with these frequencies. And if that differs from what we actually expected, in this case, we have a certain expected, we could plug that into a chi-square analysis and we'd be able to find uh, the degrees of freedom and all this other information. Essentially, we could run a statistical test on it. But I'm not going to do that. All right, going on to the next problem. This is an epistasis problem. So the agouti locus in mice has three alleles, little a, big A, and AY. Use the following cross results to infer a model of allelic effects on mouse traits to answer the following questions. Here we have a variety of parentals who are crossed together to, to uh, produce F1. And from the F1, for some of them, we have an F2 population that are produced. Now we simply just want to answer questions in regard to all these three alleles. So let's look at the first parent, or the first cross. We have individuals who are little a, little a, which have black coloring crossed with individuals who are big A, big A, who have the agouti coloring. Once these are crossed together, we get an F1 that has a total of all the individuals being agouti. Since all of the individuals in the F1 are agouti, that tells us that A, or the allele that's associated with the agouti color, is dominant to little a, which is the allele associated with the black color. In other words, A is dominant to little a. <clears throat> And we see that once we cross all these agouti individuals together for the, from the F1, we, we get a result of three-fourths being agouti and one-fourth being black. And that is consistent with typical dominant recessive inheritance when you have homo heterozygous individuals being crossed. So from this first cross, we're able to determine that big A is dominant to little a. Now we have a second cross. 
We have a y little a, little a, which is crossed with another a y little a individual. Both of them have the yellow phenotype. That results in us having, for the f one, a total of two out of three of the individuals having a yellow color, with one out of the three individuals having a black color. Now, in the ratios that we have attained, something looks a bit off. If we notice, or if we look closely, we can find that these ratios are not out of four, as they typically should be. They're out of a third. Which means that something strange has happened. So if we were to perform this cross to see what's going on, in which we have a y cross with little a, another a y cross with a little a, we we'll end up having one fourth of them that have the genotype AY, AY. Two out of four of them that have the genotype AY, little a. And one out of four of them having the genotype little a, little a. We know that yellow individuals have the genotype AY, little a from this cross. And black individuals have the genotype little a, little a from the cross above. So both of these check out. However, this genotype is not present in the population. And we know that the ratio is out of a third. So that tells us that the alleles associated with AY <clears throat> are recessive lethal effects. So when we have two AYs together, that results in the immediate death of the organism. So we do not include that in our ratio. In other words, if you have AY, AY, that results in the immediate death of the organism. Therefore, they cannot survive. So we do not include that in the ultimate uh, ratios that we have. So we can just remove that. And once we remove this, what we have to do is we have to count all of these different ratios out of three instead of out of four. So we have to change all of this to being out of three. This also tells us that AY is dominant to little a because when we have AY individual with a little a allele or an AY allele with a little a allele, that results in the expression of the yellow color, which is associated with the AY allele. Now for the third cross, we have big A, big A individuals crossed with big A, AY individuals, and that results in one half of them being a guti and one half of them being yellow. If we were to perform this cross, We find that as the F1 population has, they have half of them being a guti and half of them being yellow. If we were to perform this cross, we, would, we will find that one half have the genotype big A, big A, and one half have the genotype AY, big A. Now, what we can tell is any individual who has the AY allele expresses the yellow phenotype, even if they're crossed with a, with a big A individual or a little A individual. So that tells us that AY is dominant to big A. So now we can have a little hierarchy going on for us, in which we have AY, which is dominant, to big A, which is dominant, to little A. Now we can go and we can answer the questions that are asked in the problem. The little A allele has a, <coughs> has a recessive effect on coat color. That is true. The big A allele can have dominant or recessive effects on coat color depending on the allele it's paired with? That is correct. The big A allele can have dominant effects over the little a allele, as we have seen in this first example, which we crossed an agouti individual with a black individual, and all the offspring were agouti. And the big A allele can also have recessive effects, as seen in the third cross, in which we have an agouti individual crossed with a yellow individual. And any of the individuals who inherit it, an AY allele express the yellow color regardless of them having the big A allele, which is a recessive manner. So that is also true. And the AY allele has a dominant effect on survival. This would be false simply because the individuals that inherit two AY alleles die immediately. This is a recessive lethal effect. The fact that it has a lethal effect on them means that it cannot have a dominant effect on survival. So this would be false. In addition, the, the independently assorting little c allele is recessive to big C and prevents mice from making any fur pigment at all, resulting in albino mice regardless of the genotype at the agouti locus. 
Two mice with the genotype AY little a, big C little c are crossed. What fraction of the progeny will have the black coats color phenotype? So now we're looking at two different alleles which have epistatic effects. Recall that epistatic effects are when you have one gene which masks the effects of another gene. The C allele or the C gene can mask the effects of the A, of the a gene depending on if we get two little C alleles. Because if we get two little C alleles, no pigment will be produced at all. Therefore, no color will be expressed. So now what we're going to do is we're going to cross two individuals with the same genotype that are AY little a, big C little c, cross with one another. And we want to see the amount of individuals who can express the black coat color. Now, in order to have a black coat color that is expressed, you have to have the genotype little a, little a, as well as big C and the other allele doesn't matter. As long as we have one big C or one dominant C, that will allow for the fur pigment to be produced. Therefore, the color will be expressed. And in order to have the black color, you have to have two little a's. In order to solve this problem, you have to separate each of the genes or isolate them, and then you have to perform a cross or a Punnett square for each of them. So here I'm going to have the A gene. Here I have A Y little A, A Y little A. If I was to cross these together, I would end up with one fourth of them being AY, AY, two-fourths of them being AY, little a, one-fourth of them being little a, little a. Now, we know that the AY allele has recessive lethal effects, meaning that when we have two of them paired together, that results in the immediate death of the organism. So, we can remove that from the progeny, and we can remove that from the ratio. So now, instead of being... 2 out of 4 and 1 out of 4. These are 2 out of 3. And 1 out of 3. Now going on to the C allele. We have big C, little c, a big C, and a little c. That results in 1 out of 4 of them having big C, big C as a genotype. 2 out of 4 of them having the genotype big C, little c as a and one out of four of them having little c, little c as a genotype. Now, if we look at the requirements to be, to have the black fur, you have to have little a, little a, and big C with the other allele doesn't, not mattering. So we, we see that we have at least one big C in each of these genotypes, so we could combine the ratios together for a total of three out of four. Now what we have to do is we have to multiply the ratio of having the little a, two little a alleles with the ratio of having one big C. The ratio to having two little a's is one out of three times the ratio to having one big C, which is three out of four, which gives us a total of three out of 12, which can simplify down to one out of four. That is the ratio or the uh, fraction of having individuals who express the black coat color phenotype. Now, if this was asked, for the frequency of it, we would simply just do 1 divided by 4, which equals 0.25. And that would be our frequency. All right, on to a lac operon problem. So the equation is below. Yeah, basically, we, we know all this information. Now, for each of the genotypes, indicate whether you expect the expression of the functional beta-galactosidase activity or functional permease activity to be constitutively expressed always repressed or inducible in the presence or absence in the presence of lactose when glucose is absent okay so the way i like to go to solving these problems is i like to first go through the hierarchy that i have developed the hierarchy starts off with the promoter a mutation in the promoter results in the inability for rna polymerase to bind therefore no transcription can occur if no transcription can occur that results in repressed expression the next mutation is a mutation in the operator sequence, which can be written down as OC or, or, or O minus. I'm going to write it down as O minus because I feel like it. A mutation in the operator results in the inability for the repressor protein to bind. If the repressor protein cannot bind to the operator sequence, then nothing will stop transcription from occurring. Therefore, transcription will always occur constitutively.
We also have mutations in the repressor protein. We have IS, which is the super repressor, and that results in uh, repressed expression of the operon simply because the repressor protein is now unable to bind to lactose, so it will remain bound to the operator sequence. We also have I+, plus, which is just a regular functional repressor protein, and that results in inducible expression. We also have I-, minus. And I- minus results in constitutive expression because this repressor protein is unable to bind to the operator sequence. Now, in this, in this hierarchy that has been developed, there are elements that are cis-acting and there are elements that are trans-acting. The promoter and the operator are cis-acting elements, meaning that they are stationary and they're located directly on the DNA strand that they regulate. They're non-movable, essentially. However, the trans-acting elements, or the repressor proteins, are proteins that are able to move from one side of the cell. Exactly, they're movable. They're movable. They can go from one side to the other side. They can go from one plasmid to the other plasmid. And these are trans-acting. Now, going into solving this problem, when I, like to, when I go to solve this problem, I like to, firstly, look at what's been given. So I have these genotypes, and I want to know if we could produce beta-galactositis and permeus, and how will they be expressed. So beta-galactositis is going to be Z, and permeus is going to be Y. Now, firstly, I like to look at each of the different genotypes, and I like to see what we cannot produce. For this first genotype, we are unable to produce permeus, or Y. Therefore, I could just remove it from the genotype, because it can't be produced regardless. For the second genotype, I cannot produce beta-galactosidase, because it has a non-functional Z, Z gene. Therefore, I could just remove that from the genotype. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to break it in half, and I am going to look at the most important elements going down to the least important. The most important starts at the hierarchy, it ends at the repressor protein. Most important element is a promoter. Here is a functional promoter. Second most, operator, functional operator. Now, I have to look at the repressor proteins, but since the repressor proteins are transacting, they're movable, I have to look at both of them because each of these repressor proteins could affect one another. Here I have a functional repressor protein, and here I have a mutated repressor protein. This one is I+, plus, and this one is I-. minus. If we look at the hierarchy, we see that I+, plus takes prevalence over I-, minus, and that results in inducible expression. So this repressor protein is going to affect this genotype as well as this genotype. And that is going to result in inducible expression of Z, or beta-galactosidase. Beta-galactosidase is going to be inducible. Now for the other genotype, we have to look at the other more important elements, which are the promoter and the operator. Here we have a functional promoter, here we have a functional operator. That means that this is dependent on the repressor protein, and we know that this repressor protein takes prevalence over this repressor protein over here. So the functional repressor protein takes prevalence over the mutated repressor protein, and that results in inducible expression. Therefore, permeous activity is also inducible. For the second problem, looking at this first genotype, we cannot produce Y. Therefore, we can just remove that from the genotype. The second genotype, we cannot produce Z. We can remove that from the genotype. Now cut it in half and look at the most important elements to the least important. The most important is promoter, functional, functional operator. Now we have to look at the repressor proteins for each of them. Here's an IS and here's an I+. Plus. IS on the hierarchy is higher than I+, plus, and that results in repressed expression. So for this genotype, IS is going to take prevalence and it's going to repress the expression of Z or beta-galactosidase. So beta-galactosidase is going to be repressed. Looking at this other genotype, we have to look at the promoter, which is functional, and now we have an operator that is mutated. Since the operator is mutated, the repressor protein will be unable to bind to the operator sequence. If the repressor protein is unable to bind to the operator sequence, transcription is going to continuously occur, and nothing is going to stop it. Therefore, transcription is going to be constitutive for this genotype. For this genotype, we can't produce any beta-galactosidase or any Z because it's non-functional. However, we can produce Y, or permease, and permease is going to be produced constitutively. Does that make sense to everyone? I got it in your videos. Perfect. Like three times, so. That's great. Just make sure to like them. All right. 
here are two more problems. Um, this one, uh, I don't want to spend too much time going over it. I'm just going to... Yeah, this is the gal. So for the gal, I'm just going to write down the hierarchy. We have gal 4, which is highest on the hierarchy. And mutation in it results in repressed expression. There is gal 80, which is second highest on the hierarchy. And mutation in it results in constitutive expression. There's also gal 3. A mutation in it results in repressed expression. These are all transacting. And we see that we have mutation in GAL3 as well as GAL80. GAL80 is higher in the hierarchy. That results in constitutive expression. All right, on to the two-point cross. So in Drosophila, there are two mutations, stubble and curled, and they are linked on chromosome 3. Stubble is, dominant, is a dominant gene, and it is lethal in a homozygous state. And curled is a recessive gene. If a female with the genotype SBCU on one chromosome and plus and plus on the other chromosome is mated to detect recombinants among her offspring, what male genotype would you choose as a mate? So whenever you're trying to determine recombinants, the mate choice that you pick should always be homozygous recessive. You should always choose for them to be homozygous recessive. Now... We know that curled is a recessive gene. Therefore, we want the male to have curly for his genotype. We also know stubble is dominant gene, and it's also lethal. Since it's a dominant gene, we wouldn't even pick it anyways. However, assuming it was a recessive gene and it was lethal, we wouldn't choose it either. The reason for that is because it's lethal, and individuals cannot have that genotype without being dead. Yeah, that's basically the real answer behind it. So if we were to assume that stubble was recessive and it was also lethal, we would pick the dominant allele. However, in this case, stubble is dominant. It's also lethal, so we're just going to pick the opposing allele, which is going to be the recessive allele, the plus and the plus. So now we have the genotype for the male. Does that make sense how we pick the male genotype? Always choose the homozygous recessive individual. Unless he's lethal. Then pick the other allele. All right. Now, <clears throat> if the cross described above were made, and if SB and CU are 8.2 map units apart on chromosome 3, and if 1,000 offspring were recovered, what would be the outcome of the cross assuming that equal numbers of males and females were observed? So if we were to perform this cross with each of these different individuals, each of these different chromosomes, S, B, C, U, plus, plus, crossed with, plus, plus, C, U, C, U. So, recall that genetic recombination is going to occur. Recombination is simply when two chromatids on, a po on homologous pairs become too close to one another, and they cross over one another, and they break off, and then they recombine on the other chromosome, resulting in a different uh, genotype on the chromosome. So, let's assume we were to have recombination occurring for the male. For the male, even if we did have it occurring, it wouldn't be present. Because if this were to cross over with this side, and this side were to cross over with this side, that would result in us having the exact same chromosome. It would be plus CU plus CU. So we don't even... To, so for the individual that we are mating them with, the, the individual that we chose, especially if they are homozygous recessive, we don't need to look at recombination because they can only give out one chromosome regardless of if recombination occurs or not. However, for, the, for this female's genotype, we actually do have to look at that because it's different. Now, we're going to have two types of chromosomes. We're going to have parental chromosomes as well as recombinant chromosomes. Parental chromosomes are the same chromosomes that the original parent had. They're the original chromosomes, and we can write them down. So the mother, or the female, she has SBCU for one chromosome, as well as plus and plus for the other chromosome. And those are her parental chromosomes, her original chromosomes. If a crossover were to occur, and this plus was to flip to where the SB is, and the SB was to flip where the plus was, 
that would result in us having different chromosomes or recombinant chromosomes. So now instead of having SBCU for one genome for one chromosome, we would have plus CU for one chromosome and SB plus for the other chromosome. And these would be our recombinant chromosomes. Now from this information, we know that SB and CU, or the distance between both of these different genes, are 8.2 map units apart. Map units tells us the frequency of recombination. That's directly equal to the frequency of recombination. So, or the percent of recombination, pardon. <clears throat> so if we, if we know that these individuals or if these two genes are 8.2 map units apart, that tells us that the percent of recombination or the percent that this may occur is going to be equal to 8.2%. So these recombinants are going to occur 8.2% of the time. Now, all we would really need to do is we need to just take the father's allele, which is going to be, or the father's chromosome, which is the same for all of them and that's going to be plus cu and we would just simply just multiply them or give them to every single other genotype and that would tell us all of the different um, genotype frequencies including the recombinants that would occur in the population and if we wanted to isolate one we could easily just if we wanted to see the frequency of getting an individual who has the genotype let's just say sb plus with plus CU. We know that this plus CU is going to go to this individual who has SB and plus for a genotype. That's, that's half of the recombinants. Half of 8.2 is equal to 4.1. So this would be equal to 4.1%. And if you want to know the amount of individuals, 4.1% times 1,000 individuals would be equal to 41 so 41 of the individuals would have this genotype. That's all I have. Good luck on your exams.